From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to Middle East Focus. Uh, this week we'll be uh, looking at uh, President Trump's speech in uh, the United Nations, uh, President Rouhani's visit there, developments related to the Middle East on this busy week up in uh, the United Nations in New York. Many issues. Uh, President Trump himself focused a lot on Iran and upcoming sanctions on Iran and called on other countries to join that pressure on Iran. He talked about the sort of the Gulf Cooperation Council in the sense of mentioning Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar all in one breath, not taking a side in that dispute. Uh, talked about OPEC and uh, effectively urging Saudi Arabia to bring oil prices back down. Uh, he uh, praised uh, King Salman and uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman on their internal reforms. Uh, and there's been some other side activities uh, up in New York, uh, statements from President Trump on the Israel-Palestine issue that he now does support the two-state solution, or at least a statement that that's part of his thinking, although he's open to other things. Uh, there's been some discussions uh, on Yemen from other envoys up in, uh, up in UN and discussion about the Middle East Strategic Alliance that's supposed to put GCC countries with Jordan and Egypt and the U.S. in some future NATO. A lot to talk about, certainly. And here uh, with me to discuss these issues, uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Ambassador Jerry Firestein, who is uh, the Director for Policy Programs and Government Relations here at the Middle East Institute. Jerry, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure. Jerry's coming back from a lovely vacation uh, up in the Baltics, I believe. Indeed. So welcome back to the swamp, as they call it. <laughs> And uh, my colleague, Ahmed Majadiar, who is usually in Washington, but has fled to Omaha, Nebraska, to give a talk there. Joining us by Skype, Ahmed, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Paul. Uh, Ahmed runs our Iran Observed program, covers uh, Iranian uh, developments uh, very, very closely. Uh, so, uh, Jerry, let me start with, uh, with you. What was new in Trump's presence at the UN this time as relates to the Middle East? Well, really, um, if you if you look at his speech as well as the press conference that he did with uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu after their meeting, uh, the reality is that there's really not very much new uh, in what he had to say. His comments uh, predictably criticized Iran again, uh, called it the world's most uh, dangerous terrorist nation. He uh, talked about uh, about the uh, successes that he's had on the counterterrorism side, particularly in terms of defeating um, ISIL in Iraq and in Syria, and also, of course, as you mentioned, talking about the role that Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, and others are playing, uh, particularly in tackling terrorist financing as well as supporting uh, Syria and Iraq and their reconstruction. So many of the themes uh, were uh, very familiar, uh, really not much that was groundbreaking. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue, as you uh, referred to, many uh, people seem to be taking his comments with Netanyahu to mean that He's more openly supportive of the two-state solution than was the case in the past. But actually, if you look carefully at what he said, it was almost exactly a regurgitation of the formula that he used yeah, he went early on to last say, year. Whatever they agree uh, on. Uh, one yeah. state, two state, whatever the, the parties agree to, which mm -hmm. is exactly what he said a year ago. So it didn't really seem as though there was very much there, although he did apparently discomfit uh, Netanyahu for a moment by repeating uh, a, uh, an assertion that he had made before, uh, which is that the Israelis would now have to step up and do something major for the Palestinians in order mm -hmm. to balance out uh, his move of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, how do you read from the U.S. side his, uh, I mean, anything new on the Iran strategy? I mean, obviously sanctions are going ahead. Nothing new there. Uh, he keeps saying on and off, I'm willing to meet with the Iranians and things of that nature. Is this a gambit similar to the North Korea one that, you know, escalate in order to negotiate? Or do you think this is more just, a, you know, a solid position without much uh, result afterwards? Well, it's hard to say. And I, I think that that's a, it's a fair question. And of course, 
his, uh, his comments included a peon, uh, if you will, to, uh, to Rouhani personally, who he uh, referred to as a very uh, worthy gentleman or, or something along those lines. And so uh, you could look at it possibly as his thinking that he could use the same strategy with, with Rouhani and the Iranians that he used with uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, but of course, there are clear differences in the in the way that uh, the Iranian uh, government operates, as opposed to the North Korean. Indeed, nothing yeah. nothing in common. Really, <laughs> nothing, in many nothing cases. In common. Well, yeah. let me turn to uh, Ahmed. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, tell us a bit about you know what Rouhani, President Rouhani of Iran, uh, his statements, his positions, his messaging in the UN and his meetings. Uh, what has he been up to? I would argue that President Rouhani had more success than President Trump, uh, both at the UN General Assembly and also in the sideline meetings that happened between uh, officials of the two countries with other world leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that President Trump's anti-Iran speech backfired. Uh, he, of course, called on all nations to isolate Iran's regime. He called uh, for international support to increase uh, economic and diplomatic pressure. Uh, to force the Iranian leaders for a new and comprehensive uh, nuclear new deal that would address not only Iran's nuclear activities, but also ballistic missile issues and also regional actions and policies. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we saw that that most uh, world leaders, uh, they voiced support for uh, the existing Iran deal. They rejected uh, a U.S. withdrawal from uh, the nuclear deal. And many of them actually praised the Iran deal as an achievement of multilateral diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And on his part, President Rouhani tried to use the General Assembly and also the sideline meetings uh, to isolate Washington. Uh, he, his team had meetings with uh, senior representatives of other signatories of the deal from the European powers and also China and Russia. And they discussed ways of uh, blocking the U.S. sanctions, uh, creating a new financial system so that these countries continue business with Iran. Uh, so uh, as a whole, I think that it was uh, relatively a successful uh, trip for, uh, for President Rouhani because his also tough message against Washington that also won him some support amongst uh, hardliners back home. And I would uh, I completely agree with Jerry uh, that the politics of uh, Iran and North Korea are very different because there are different centers of power in Iran. And that makes any kind of grand bargain with Washington more complicated and more difficult. President Rouhani, I believe, would be very happy to meet with President Trump. Uh, but because of his domestic politics, that makes it more difficult. Well, let me pry a little bit into that. A number of things, I mean, even though I'm sure, you know, in the UN, uh, because most of the European countries, Russia and China, are signatories, well, the big ones are signatories to the deal. They didn't like President Trump's withdrawal or much of his statement, I would assume, uh, in the national in the General Assembly. Uh, but on the same at the same time, it's still a fact that once these u s. sanctions hit, I mean, things in Iran or the Iranian economy are bad and are going to get worse. And President Rouhani certainly is worried and has to worry about that. On the uh, other side, uh, Rouhani published an op-ed in the Washington Post just before the UN meetings last weekend, indicating sort of a general willingness to negotiate and talk, a very sort of open op-ed. He didn't mention the US or President Trump by name. He did also mention that he's been invited to meet with Trump or meet with US officials eight times, I think he said. So I get it that you know he's mopping up sort of the goodwill in the UN building. But he still has a huge problem on his hands uh, that Iran, you know, it's a very, very serious problem, as you yourself have written. So how do you see the longer term strategy, not just of President Rouhani, but perhaps of the supreme leader? Uh, is, it, is the strategy, do you think, just to ride out Trump until 2020, uh, assuming that, you know, they'll have to deal with him at least till then? How are they going to get through this? You're absolutely right, because uh, the reimposition of sanctions uh, has already had a very significant impact on the Iranian economy, because although uh, the European countries, uh, they support the Iran nuclear deal and they are opposing uh, uh, the sanctions, uh, but big uh, companies and international banks, they make their own decisions and they don't listen to the governments. And most of them have already pulled out or they've scaled down their activities inside Iran. 
So President Rouhani understands that, and other Iranian leaders understand that as well. And that's the reason that President Rouhani is keeping the door for diplomacy with Washington open. Uh, of course, uh, they are saying that the U.S. should return to the nuclear deal, and then we can talk. But that position may uh, uh, may even just change uh, if the regime sees that these uh, the impact of uh, sanctions would become even worse, and and it will become worse after the next round of sanctions, which kicks in and on November fourth, uh, that targeting the Iranian uh, oil sector and also a central bank. Uh, so he understands that, uh, but but again, what the point I was making was that it, it is difficult for him that, like the North Korean Kim Jong Un, he comes and just sit down with President Trump and just make a grand bargain and make yeah, a deal. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt, very different politics. And if I may just mention, uh, there was one interesting point that President uh, Trump mentioned about the oil. Uh, the State Department had previously said that it wanted all uh, foreign countries to bring their uh, import of Iranian oil to zero. But in his speech, uh, President Trump said that countries should substantially decrease import of oil. Interesting. Uh, that, to me, uh, indicated a shift in strategy that uh, perhaps the administration is willing to give waivers and exemptions to certain countries, perhaps like India and China, uh, so that un until that these countries have alternative imports from other countries, uh, so that does not r result in a hike of uh, oil price globally and here in the United S States, particularly as midterm elections are coming in. Yeah, also Iraq uh, might need an exemption. There was an Iraqi delegation in town last week making clear that 40% uh, of Iraq's electricity production is produced by uh, imports, direct imports of Iranian natural gas, and that Iraq doesn't have a quick way to replace that. And if these sanctions hit in early November, half of the Iraqi power grid would go down, and that would cause almost a revolution in Iraq. They can't do that. So yeah, maybe Afghanistan exemptions has the same problem, well. and they're also calling for exemptions, both in terms of importing oil and also using Chabahar port, uh, which is being developed by Iran and India. Yeah, thanks. Well, if, if, I can, if I can just add to that, of course, the other uh, mention uh, that Trump made about OPEC was, of course, as you said, his complaint about the high uh, oil prices. Uh, but a number of uh, observers here in the U.S. have made the observation that, in fact, uh, his own policies of trying to reimpose sanctions on Iran are, in fact, a major contributor to the rise of oil prices. And so, to a certain extent, there is going to be a domestic cost uh, to the president uh, for pursuing uh, this Iran strategy as uh, as gasoline prices begin to rise here in the U.S. Well, Jerry, I, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, uh, has this? I mean, his statement about OPEC, which seemed to be directed against Saudi Arabia, because you know he said we offer protection and oil prices, and it was very visceral when he talked about it. He got very, very visceral about it. Has this been coming up at this high pitch in recent months, or is this the first? time you've heard it at this level? He's uh, referred in the past uh, to his unhappiness about rising oil prices. The markets uh, just passed uh, uh, the other day uh, a new uh, benchmark uh, for Brent of uh, $80 a barrel, uh, which is the highest it's been in four years. There's been some talk in oil uh, circles uh, that uh, oil might even uh, reach $100 a barrel again. Uh, and so clearly the direction is, is uh, one that is a problem for uh, the administration. Uh, so uh, he is unhappy uh, about it. But, of course, it's not OPEC that determines oil prices anymore. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's a, a reflection of 1970s thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really the markets that, that set the price, and they are reacting to a number of different factors, including the uh, imposition, re-imposition of Iran sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Ahmed, let me ask you, I didn't hear anything in, the, in President Trump's speech about the longest running war, which is the one in Afghanistan. Uh, you've been following events up in New York. Has anything come out of any of the speeches or the meetings uh, that might impact the situation in Afghanistan? No, he did not address uh, Afghanistan issue uh, at all. And, and indeed, there are unconfirmed reports that uh, 
uh, the Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani, uh, wanted to attend the UN General Assembly, uh, but because President Trump was not willing to meet with him on the sidelines of the General Assembly, he did not attend. And then instead, he sent uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, who's the chief executive of Afghanistan, uh, to the assembly. Uh, and also, there are reports that uh, the administration, uh, uh, particularly President Trump himself, has again gotten tired of the Afghan war, and he's seeking a way out of the country. And uh, most likely, just as the uh, next presidential elections uh, come forward. Uh, that is because his South Asia strategy, which had two key pillars, one that to uh, increase uh, the military mission in Afghanistan to uh, weaken the Taliban on the battlefield or force it to come to the negotiating table, that has not yielded any results. And the second pillar of that was to pressure Pakistan to either end the terrorist sanctuaries on its soil or uh, to uh, compel the Afghan Taliban leaders uh, to compromise for a political settlement with the Afghan government, that also has not uh, shown any results. So he is now uh, reportedly telling uh, uh, Defense Secretary Mattis and others in the administration that we need to wrap up the Afghan war and we need to just uh, uh, do actually something President Obama did that uh, set a timeline for U.S. withdrawal. Thank you, Ahmed. Jerry, I wanted uh, to ask you about this purported Middle East strategic alliance, uh, the idea that's been uh, kicked around in the last few months about uh, a strategic alliance uh, with the GCC, Gulf countries, with Egypt and Jordan and the U.S. as well, it has obvious problems in the internal divisions, uh, also lack of, you know, sort of cooperation and compatibility in those cases. Um, how do you see it? I mean, uh, which is it? Um, is it is it the Department of Defense, the Pentagon that is pushing this? Is it more of a White House idea? Does it have any legs? Well, I think it's a it's a concept that's been out there for a long time. Uh, it it not uh, it's not particularly new uh, for this administration. Uh, I think uh, again, as as you mentioned, there are real structural obstacles uh, to actually seeing this. Um, become a real uh, uh, a real defense alliance. I mean, obviously, uh, the uh, the continuation of the uh, uh, disagreements between uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, Bahrain on on one hand, but even uh, even without that, uh, the reality is that uh, that uh, even within the GCC. Uh, there's never really been a, a clear commitment to uh, so to work defense. together yeah. in common defense. They they have uh, from time to time been able to agree on lowest common denominator kinds of of uh, defense uh, issues, but uh, to go beyond that and actually begin to engage in practical uh, cooperative measures, it's never really been uh, the case. The Obama administration tried on ballistic missile defense um, uh, in the uh, latter part of the Obama administration. Uh, there have been other efforts. So uh, it's, uh, I think, an idea that looks um, uh, promising, interesting on paper, uh, but when you actually try to translate it uh, from uh, a paper agreement to something that has real, uh, real impact, real significance, uh, I suspect that it's never really going to mm. get there. And I think it's been uh, Tim Lenderking of the State Department who's been, again, tasked uh, with going and trying to figure this out. But I wanted, speaking of Tim Lenderking, I mean, he's also been uh, talking about uh, U.S. engagement in Yemen with the, with the coalition there, uh, uh, about more coordination in order to limit uh, mistakes and collateral damage and so on, and in order to get some political process going as, as a closing uh, sort of comment, given that our time is coming to an, en an end. Where do you see the U.S.-Yemen policy uh, right now? Well, I think it's becoming increasingly problematic for the administration and, and the unhappiness on the Hill with the, uh, with the continued conflict, uh, with the inability of the uh, Saudis and the Emiratis to, uh, to uh, end these kind of mass casualty uh, incidents. Uh, to um, to show clear results for uh, what is now well into the fourth year of the conflict is beginning uh, 
uh, to uh, to impose real costs. Uh, I think that you're seeing uh, a more vocal, bipartisan uh, uh, effort on the Hill to really restrict the U.S. ability to continue supporting uh, the uh, the Saudi-led coalition. And so, uh, on the one hand, you have uh, what seems to be a stalemate uh, on the political side, uh, as we saw earlier this month, Mar- uh, uh, Martin Griffith's ability uh, uh, to convoke the parties and get them at least to begin talking about things that they can do uh, was very limited. Uh, Geneva was widely perceived to, uh, perceived to be a failure. And is that because the Houthis... Well, the Houthis, uh, yes, up. and mm-hmm. and and the question is, uh, you know, what was uh, Griffith's understanding in advance, and 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 why uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the day uh, was he not even able to get the uh, the Houthis to come to Geneva, let alone to the table? Yeah. So uh, so you have a stalemate on the political side. Uh, you don't have very much progress on the military side, and you continue— and, and in and around Hodeida. Uh, Hodeida port, particularly. Because there was talk of opening humanitarian corridors, and uh, what's you know, the and, and, there? And there, there are a lot of other things that are going on, and so, and, and so for example, uh, the Saudis have announced a lot of new assistance going into to Yemen, uh, but you also get the persistent uh, reports about uh, a growing humanitarian crisis— uh, and uh, and clearly, you know, the expansion of uh, humanitarian suffering in the country is is notable, uh, and and you continue to get the um, the periodic uh, incidents where the Saudis and the Emiratis, frankly speaking, uh, simply don't uh, operate in a way that uh, ensures low collateral damage, and so uh, all of these things are coming together, squeezing the U.S. as well as the U.K. and other Western. Uh, friends of the Saudis and and uh, the coalition uh, uh, to uh, to really back away from support. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll make a plug here that uh, MEI is holding a uh, conference on Yemen, a big conference on Yemen on Thursday, October four, at the National Press Club in Washington D.C. Uh, from one p.m. to five to five p.m. Excellent panels and speakers. Ambassador Firestein will be there as well as others. Uh, you can get full information about that on our website, mei.edu. Uh, it'll be uh, uh, broadcast uh, over the Internet uh, uh, and also be videotaped for later viewing. So I had those interested in, in Yemen, uh, that's a good place to, to go to. So I want to thank my two guests, Ahmad Majadiar, uh, tuning in from Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank you, Paul. It was a pleasure uh, to be with you and Jerry this morning for this timely discussion. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, Jerry, for uh, joining us so soon after your vacation. Sorry to get you right back in the thick of it, but uh, that's life in D.C. And, Even uh, more complicated than the Baltics. Than when you left, yes, <laughs> or the Baltics <laughs> themselves, yes. And thanks, uh, Scott Zuki, who, who uh, uh, directs all of this uh, behind the scenes. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in, and we will see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.